Let us go to the word, Psalm 119, 43, just a verse there. Do not snatch the word of truth from my mouth, for I have put my hope in your laws. Again, do not snatch the word of truth from my mouth, for I have put my hope in your laws. Amen. And John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Read that again. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. God is the God of truth. God is the God of truth. God is the God of truth. And I know in some English translation, like the latest NIV, it says faithfulness in Psalm 31, 5. But uh, earlier translation, it says truth. So he is the God of truth. Um, because he is the God of truth, um, the re what makes him the God of truth is that his essence, his nature is true. Uh, Jeremiah 10.10, 10, he's the true God. And as John 1.17 says, truth comes from him. So from him comes truth, for he is the true God. And therefore his words are true, Hebrews 6.18. And he gives birth to children, his children, by the word of truth, James 1.18. Uh, and he nurtures them by the word of truth. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 10 to 11, it says. So everything about, is, about God is truth. He is true and he's of truth. He speaks the truth. Truth comes out of him. He gives birth through truth. He nurtures through the truth. And that is the word of truth. So if we believe in God, it means that we believe him to be the true God. If we believe his word to be the truth, so we believe the word of truth. So believing in the word of truth means to trust that word as is not adding on not taking away not kind of like half and half but really taking the word of god as is and trusting that it is the truth how many of you have this faith um then if you have this faith you have to live every day based on that faith um that is the christian life that's to have the ears to hear the word of truth discern discernibly discernibly so to be able to discern and to hear the word of truth, um, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, correctly handle the word of truth. So to be able to correctly identify what the word of truth is, as opposed to lies, right? And to respond to that word, to respond according to that word every day. Respond to that word every day, Hebrews 6, 7 to 8. So to live according to that word, to respond and react according to that word of truth, that's what the Christian life is about. How many of you want to know the truth? Tell me the truth. How many of you have said that, right? I want to know the truth. What is the truth, right? Um, if humans want the truth, you bet your bottom dollars that God definitely never surpasses the truth. I've right, been hearing what God does not surpass. He will never surpass the truth because he is of truth. Now, the word truth, even if you may not like focus on it and examine it and study it as the truth, but this is really very important because what do you base on? What, your faith, what is your faith? What is your understanding based on? Nobody wants to base on their lives on lies, right? When something is identified to be truth, Everything else is not true. It's like that, right? Black and white. So to investigate the truth, like this is what journalists do, what reporters, what uh, detective, like I want to find the truth. What happened to this person or that, you know, location or that group or situation. So it's investigate what the truth is. Um, simply truth uh, means a principle that does not change, that does not change. So if anything changes, it's not true. Um, so... Basically, all bodies of knowledge, um, let's say in academics, um, in scholarly uh, bodies of work, uh, are all about examining, investigating, examining uh, what truth is. So, um, certainly, uh, um, before, um, I could, well, among the bodies of knowledge, philosophy uh, can be thought as the basis, right, of all forms of knowledge, because from philosophy comes arts and science and all that. So uh, philosophy is important and philosophy is connected to religion because well, many religions come from uh, and, and they sort of borderline philosophy and religion. So many people consider that the effort of the religious people or the religious teaching is about finding what is truth 
um, and therefore pretty much everyone's truth is the same. This is how the world consider, right? So whether you're Buddhist or Buddhism, uh, Buddhist teaching or Christian teaching or Jewish teaching or uh, Muslim teaching or of Islam, that the, the truth is really one and of the same. So whichever way you take it, you're all gonna end up in the same place. This is how the world sees religions, philosophies and religions, and uh, religions operate on this principle that if you renew your heart, um, if you change your heart, because the heart tends to kind of bend and go as it wishes and it's wishy-washy sometimes, so you need to cultivate yourself, educate yourself, discipline yourself, and you start with the hum. Meditate, meditate, right? So meditate is like uh, mindfulness. Empty out all the distraction and, and empty, 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 empty. And then somehow when you empty yourself to the point of beating your body and starving and, and staring into the sun and then sitting out in the sun and the heated place for 25 years every day, as I said, <laughs> mentioned last week of an example, extreme example, then perhaps you go, ding, I'm in nirvana. Yeah, so you can be enlightened like Buddha was under a tree and then enlightened and then you've sort of are now at a place of mind. Uh, it's different from everyone else. So you're no longer ordinary, but you're very special. You're very special because you've arrived there. So that's what um, the religious uh, understanding uh, of uh, the truth or truths may be. But of course, religions are not the only one. Science uh, is the effort of investigating what truth is. So science doesn't um, invent, or scientists, or the effort of science as a body of knowledge is not inventing, but it's about discovering. Certainly, you can base on the discoveries, and then you hand it over to engineers, and then they invent something, right? So um, scientists, however, are discovering uh, through their observation of what is going on from uh, something small uh, in cells um, to, uh, to the macro level of the universe. So they observe the, quote unquote, the truth of nature. Like, what is the nature about? So you call it the law of nature. Um, so there is something like the universal law of gravitation uh, or the law of gravity, right? Um, uh, or Newton's law of motion, um, Kepler's law of planetary motion. You've learned this in your physics class. Some of you are having already like twitching experience, like I don't like that. Um, but these are very important because based on them, everything is, everything that we live in and, and function uh, be, uh, is, comes from that, right? So buildings, cars, everything is based on these um, laws that are in, uh, present in what's called um, nature. So uh, the what the scientists are, dis they have discovered to this day is that um, the truth of nature is that all things in the world, in the universe, on earth, um, have a lifespan. Nothing lives forever. It has a lifespan, meaning anything that has a beginning has an end. Anything that's alive now will be dead one day. Right? So starting from cells to even stars. Stars have lifespan. Um, and even the universe, we don't know exactly how long uh, ago it came about. Uh, even the scientists, even though they say billion, billion, billions years ago, they still don't know. Because who was there to see anyway, right? And we don't know when it's going to end. Um, so, but then the idea is that it, will, it has a beginning and end. Um, so there is something called the law of thermodynamics, uh, which is about the relationship between uh, thermal energy heat or heat with uh, other forms of energy. There's the first law, second law, and third law. But in the second law, there is something called entropy, uh, which is that energy, um, the, it's about the quality of energy that um, is transferred or transformed. Uh, when it's transferred or transformed, the energy is then uh, wasted. So what you have is um, disorder, randomness, or uncertainty. Simply put, Everything, you give it a time, it will degrade. It's not going to stay the same. Even though that according to the law, that the energy, the amount, the quantity of energy will be the same, the quality is not the same. So everything degrades over time. So we don't need to know about this thing called law of thermodynamics. We know that if we put a piece of meat out on the countertop when it's 90 degrees outside, it's going to rot. When somebody dies and that body then perishes. We know that, right? So... Uh, this is the understanding of, uh, according to the truth of uh, nature, is that nothing stays the same as in the quality. It has a beginning of life, and then that will end. And um, that makes, therefore, the world uh, very meaningless, in essence. But not only that, it really blinds us humans 
from or uh, limits us from knowing the truth because we ourselves change. Humans change, the bodies change, the minds change, the hearts change, the environment changes all the time. So there is no way for humans to arrive at the truth on our own. Um, and with that, there is no way for humans to uh, speak the truth even. Hear the truth, speak the truth, because it involves knowing the truth. How do we know what is true and what is not? Even though we operate every day, humans operate and have been operating for thousands of years thinking that we know the truth. Um, nowadays, uh, there is something called, with the development of um, you know, machine run learning and artificial intelligence, AI, uh, something called deep fakes. You've heard deep uh, fake news, right? A lot of it. Uh, we heard a lot of uh, fake news. But fake news is one of the things that deep fakes produces. So deep fakes is like a blend of words called deep, uh, from deep learning, as in the computer machine, and fake. So they made this work deep fakes. Uh, so the deep fake uh, is something, it's called synthetic media, in which the existing person in an image or moving image, still image or moving image, is altered to look like someone else. And it's... In the past, it looked like fake. Like, you know, Photoshop, like you can tell. It's like, that's not his body or that's not her face. But now, thanks to uh, machine learning or deep learning of AIs, which are super, super smart. Like even your, your smartphones, they learn how you use the phone. So it's suggesting all these things. Like I was texting someone. I was texting Esther and Esther's picture like from years ago popped up. Siri suggested, do you like this picture? I was like, no. I was, it was like so creepy. I'm like, I mean, no, I like her, but I don't want you to tell me that's her picture because you know that I'm te texting her right now. I got like chills down my back because it, it figures out for you because it's learning from you. Yeah. So like that, um, computers are so smart now that they manipulate and generate um, the definition of manipulate or generate visual audio content with high potential to deceive. Um, so this, um, deepfakes have uh, generated widespread attention, especially uh, of late, um, like pornography you know, with celebrities or even regular people, um, fake news, uh, hoaxes, uh, and even having financial fraud implications. So they have something of non-consequent consequential uh, situations, like personal, targeting one person, transpose or changing the picture, so be careful what you put up on social media, in other words, right? Because they can take your, take your image or moving image and put it onto something else and then send it out to Reddit or whatever, and then it's out there. Um, so the scientists at MIA, uh, MIT and Harvard have come up with this. They made this movie last year um, in, in event of moon disaster in which um, the president, Richard Nixon, in 1969, was it when the landing of the moon, makes a speech saying that uh, the Apollo... 11 mission saying that it failed, that the space shuttle exploded. It didn't, right? It landed on the moon, uh, but Neil Arm he says Neil Armstrong died. So that video was based on the super, super sophisticated program where his voice and his face was altered from the original video where he says, congratulations, we have you know landed on the moon. But they changed it. So uh, the scientists put it up um, the video on their website um, and then it had million uh, people reaching uh, it within weeks. They said about 49% of the people who visited the site and watched the video believe that his alter face was real, and then 65% of them thought the voice was real. Meaning, meaning the majority of people couldn't tell the difference whether it was real or uh, not. So right now there are about 50,000 um, or more deep fake videos online right now. I'm sure there's even more now. Um, and there's some website called This Person Does Not Exist. So there are computer-generated images of people that look real, but they're not real. So it's, it's AI picking up different features of the face and making a fake person. And then they use that. So you really can tell. They could be telling a, taking a piece of your eye, eyebrow or like one nostril from you and from someone else and then putting it all together and making this uh, fake person. So it's really hard to tell. With the development of technology and uh, IT, you would think that it would be better for us. It would give us more tools and information about finding what the truth is. Unfortunately, sadly, and scarily that, it's becoming harder to discern what is truth from what is not.
And what the Bible tells us is that, yes, this is the reality because the only truth is in God alone. That he, his word, his law alone is the truth. Psalm 119, 142, as we read, your law is true. John 17, 17, your word is truth. When this God, the true God, created the heavens and the earth, he is the one who put in place so-called the truths of nature. That when he said, let there be light and let there be expand, let there be land, and each day of the six days of his creation, as we read in Genesis 1, was when God placed in these principles called the truths, you know, the laws of nature. And each day, it's the same pattern. It says there was evening and there was morning the first day, the second day, the third day. So it's like a, almost like a pendulum rhythm, tick, tock, tick, tock. So there was evening, there was morning. It's telling us that with nature, what's, what's called nature or created things, there is time. There is limit. There is a lifespan. There's beginning. There's end. So there's destruct, de, de, uh, destruction and there's construction. Right? So there is tearing down, there's building up. There's tearing down, building up. There's death. There is then resurrection. This is the uh, understanding of the Hebrew uh, people or Hebrew faith based on this. Knowing that God is the one who placed this rhythm or this principle of having beginning and end and showing that everything in this world, therefore, cannot know the truth because truth is not supposed to change. But the fact that it has beginning and end means it changes. It changes. Everything about it changes. Then what to do, what to make of the truth. The Bible reminds us that faith comes from hearing and therefore we need to pay attention to the word of truth. The word that God wants to give us souls right now in this place for us souls to hear say amen if you know you're a soul if you were here last week that's what you heard yes i'm a soul together i'm a soul and if i'm a soul i don't end there but i need to hear the word that gives me life amen yes so that word is the word of truth that god wants the souls to hear and that is called the word of truth colossians 1 5 also the word of the son hebrews 1 2 all this i'll put it in, in the summary later the word of christ romans 10 17 the word of the lord hebrews 2 3 the word of faith, Hebrews 10, 8. So that is the word that God wants souls to hear and receive. And the Bible outlines a history in details of God discerning the truth from false and punishing those who are in the false, in the wrong. It considers, the Bible considers liars and those who are being lied to. Those who deceive and those who are deceived as the same. Gullible? What is it? What's the joke? That gullible is not in a big dictionary or something like that? It's like, oh, really? Yeah, that person is deceived. Yes? So you are either the deceiver or both the deceiver and the deceived. So Ezekiel 14 10 says, they will bear their guilt. The prophet will be as guilty as the one who consults him. So you want to consult the lying prophet? You are just as guilty as the lying prophet if you seek his cons uh, uh, counsel. So considering liars and those who are deceived by the liars as the same. And what's the result? Revelation 21, verse 8 and verse 8, 27 says, The cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magical arts, the idolaters. And you go, I'm not any of that. Oh my gosh, no, no way. But it says, and all liars. They will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Nothing impure will ever enter the holy city. So anyone who does anything shameful or deceitful. So even if one may think like, I don't commit a murder, I don't do any of that, but they still lie, or they, this, they li li listen, like to listen to lies, they will be treated the same and be cast out into darkness. Actually, that is the fiery place called hell. Now, why is this a problem for us? Why do we have to worry about being lied to or lying? Because our ancestor, Adam, the living being who lived in the Garden of Eden, when he was given the word to live for his soul, which said, do not eat from this tree of the knowledge good and evil. That was the word of God, the word of truth he had to live by. But did he listen to that word? Maybe for a while he did. But ultimately, he listened to his wife's word. Definition of husbands, they need to listen to their wife. Yeah, someone told me that. Happy, happy wife, happy life. Yeah, so you need to listen to your wife, and then you have a happy life. So maybe that's what Adam thought. All right, so I need to listen to my wife. My wife says, let's eat the fruit. It's okay. Who does she listen to? She listened to the serpent. 
And the serpent said, you will not surely die. Are you kidding? God was kidding. He didn't mean it. You couldn't eat it. You will not surely die. Your spirit will be fine. Actually, you'll be like God. So that's in Genesis 3, um, 4 on. We see the serpent deceiving the woman. And the woman, after having eaten the forbidden fruit, she gives the husband, Adam. And Adam is deceived uh, by the word, not being able to discern the word of truth of God and then listening to the lie. By eating that fruit, however, instead of becoming like God, sin enters the spirit of Adam. And therefore, the price of sin comes with that. Now, who is that serpent? The serpent is the devil, right? The, the devil comes in the form of the serpent. And who is the devil? The devil is a fallen angel, right? So in the spiritual heaven, he was an angel who was beautifully made, talented, made to worship God. But he said to himself, who did he listen to? Himself. So be careful who you listen to, right? If your heart is evil, and the Bible says man's heart is evil, yes. So it's not like, well, I don't really feel like it. I feel like it. Be careful what that feel is based on, right? So here is the devil thinking, I can be like God. I will be like the Most High. Why not? I'm going to raise myself, lift myself, ascend above the stars of God. I will sit on the throne of God. Isaiah 14, 12, 15, he said to himself, and he carried out into action by leaving his position, proper position of serving God, and he stopped doing his work of serving God. Jude 1, 6 says, as a result, he was cast out, along with those who followed him, into the universe, where we are, to be contained until the day of judgment, and then punishment later on. So the reality became, for humans coming after Adam, we are now dead in spirit, sin in the spirit the spirit then would be destined to go to hell as a result and then the rest of time until then physically we hear lies and we can't tell we can't discern the truth from lies and lies from truth and in fact humans like to listen to lies because they sound sweet to the ears that become the that became the reality for all men but we do see as someone like uh, Noah that God calls um, to warn him about this great deluge that was coming and warned him about that and, and commanded him to build an ark for himself to be saved from that deluge uh, in holy fear Noah believed even if he didn't see a drop of rain he believed he not, he not only believed the moment he heard from God but for about 70 years he believed isn't that amazing? 70 years Seven years. So for seven years, he did not waver. He did not doubt in the word of the truth, the word of God. And he built that ark. And he and his family, therefore, were the only survivors through the ark from that deluge while it destroyed the entire planet. Do we believe that? How many of you believe that? Yes? Hebrews 11 7, um, says that. Um, co contrast, by contrast, Lot, the nephew of Abraham, uh, to whom angels went to warn of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah coming next morning, had uh, daughters and, they ha uh, and uh, their, husbands, their husbands listening to this warning. But the sons-in-law treated the warning as joke. Genesis 19 says they're like, okay, yeah, whatever, because that's what they did. And they did not therefore follow Lot and the daughters, and initially the wife too, Lot's wife, to leave the city, just as the angels had said. If you want to survive the destruction, run out. The sons-in-law said, ah, it's not going to happen. Okay, good luck with that. We'll see you later. So they stayed. And what happened to them then? While the entire city of Sodom, or the both cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, burnt down um, by the brimstone fire, the burning sulfur, uh, they were there as well to be destroyed. So that's the contrast of those who listened to the word of God as truth and those who did not. They couldn't tell the difference. So when God chose the people of Israel later on, gave them the law. And the law um, was given through a man named Moses. So the law is called the law of Moses. Say it with me, the law of Moses. So we say law of Moses. It's not Moses who wrote it. Like he's not the author. He did write it down later on. But he received it from God in the stone tablets the first time around. And then brought down. And later God instructed him. And then he carved it in the stone tablets. Anyhow, these are the words of God that Moses delivered. So that, that's why it's called the law of Moses. Starting with the Ten Commandments. There were hundreds of more to that law. So in the Ten Commandments, the first commandment said what? Exodus 20 outlines that. You will not... You shall have no other 
God before me. Together, you, will, you shall have no other God before me. What does that mean? Because all other gods, there may be others, small g's, gods, are not true. They're not true God. I am the only true God, the only God of truth. Because truth comes from me, I am the one who made them all. So you are to have no other God before me. That was the first, that is the first commandment, and then the rest comes. And then um, the second commandment is on idolatry. So do not make an image for yourselves, uh, an image of uh, the creatures in heaven, on earth, whatever it is, in the sea, uh, and then bow down to it. So do not commit adultery, uh, idolatry, later adultery, but idolatry, um, because uh, anyone who would have any other gods or anyone who commits idolatry, then in the same commandments, it also said, do not give false testimony, right? In other words, do not lie. All those commandments are treated the same because you, you lie, right? Stealing is a form of lying too. So you cheat, all these things, because you are, have now put not the true God before you. So that's the result. So the result is the same, which is death. So the law of Moses is also called the law of sin and death. Say it with me, the law of sin and death. Because it taught about sin and the price of sin, which is death. Because God never surpasses the truth, and truth is law. God never surpasses the law. So in the Old Testament, it was the law of Moses by which God condemned, judged, and punished. So all who were found to be guilty were judged and punished to death. So the temple reminded uh, the people of this for generations to come because the temple was where the name of the Lord was. The name of the Lord of the Old Testament. Anyone know who, what that name is? Jehovah was there in the temple. And in the ark were the stone tablets that had the Ten Commandments. These are also called the tablets of the covenant law or the testimony, which again reminded them all together as a structure, there's no other true God but Jehovah. If you say there's anyone else, you're dead. That was the reminder through the temple. So now, remember, the tablets were brought down by Moses from the mountain. And when he was speaking with God for 40 days and not even eating anything, you would think that he would come back like, I need to be lifted by a helicopter. But when he comes down, what do you look like? His face was what? Radiant. Radiant. I, I, we say shining, but because shining could be like from oils and stuff, but it's radiant. <laughs> I know I keep on saying shining too. I'm like, look at the uh, uh, Bible. It says radiant because shining could be uh, from other stuff, but radiant like the sun, like the sun. That people were so afraid, and because Moses was so gentle and compassionate, he put a veil over his head to not scare the people. I would have been like, oh yeah, <laughs> zoom in on me. Yes, <laughs> watch me. But he came down and he spoke to people. And when people saw that his face was radiant, meaning this is the evidence that he spoke with God. And then the stone tablets that he brought down are the result of his speaking with God. So the words that are written in the stone tablets were the law. And the law was spoken to the people through Moses. So the words of Moses were the words of the Lord, but really in Hebrews 2, 2, these are the words or the message of angels because the angels spoke in the name Jehovah to the people. Again, you need to go back a couple weeks, right? So we've been building on all the sermons that we've been hearing about what God does not surpass. So his name, his word, his will, and all of that. So spoken through angels, still the people feared uh, of the law, fear the word of Moses uh, written in the law. Um, and the prophets were those who spoke the word of God that came to them. So Ezekiel, Jeremiah, um, El Elijah, and First King 18, 1 says, the word of the Lord came to me. So these were ordinary people. Suddenly the word of the Lord will come to them. And ordinary people does not mean they were like pagans and doing evil things. They were sought out by God. And when God saw them as worthy of using, then... Then from that moment on, God would speak to them and they would speak to the people what they heard. So the word of the Lord would come to them and speak to the people. And usually the prophets had the message, not like, you're so special. You're, you're my peach, you're my star. But it's more like, repent, otherwise, otherwise. Because people 
were going astray. They said, amen, and we will keep the law, but they realized they were breaking all the time, and they were condemned by the law, and they were sinning against God by committing idolatry, worshiping other gods, even though God warned them through and throughout, over and over, and by the temple, they reminded them, they continued to do so. So these prophets that the Lord spoke to, spoke the word of the Lord, However, the people were foolish and wicked, did not lend their ears to the words of the prophets. Instead, they listened to the false prophets. They were enticed by the lies that they spoke. Ezekiel 13, um, verse 6 and 8 to 9 says, Their visions are false, their divinations are lie. Even though the Lord has not sent them, they say, The Lord declares and expect him to fulfill their words. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says, verses 8 to 9 says, Because your false words and lying divisions, I am against you, declares the sovereign Lord. My hand will be against the prophets who see false visions and utter lying divinations. So these are the people who never heard from the Lord, but they said, the I, the Lord speak, the Lord declares. And the people liked it. People liked it. Because they were saying false things. And that's what their hearts desire. Because there's no truth in men. For they are all sinners. So they wanted to hear the lies. And because of that, God cursed them. And that disaster, that uh, number of disasters written in the law of Moses fell on the people of Israel. However, what gave them hope was this prophecy that was said by Zechariah in chapter 8, verse 3. It says, thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called, in the NIV it says, faithful city. But in the New King James, it says, the city of truth. Jerusalem will be called the city of what? Truth. The mountain of the Lord hosts the holy mount. And if you put together with Malachi 2 6, let's read that together. Malachi 2 6, which is the last book of the Old Testament. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sins. True instruction, or uh, on other places, a law of truth was in his mouth. Nothing false was found on his lips. So who was Malachi prophesying about the one to come? It was Yeshua, hallelujah. And in that name he came, the son of God, and standing before that temple of Jerusalem, that will be called the city of truth, because now the truth has come. <gasps> and what did he say about that temple? Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days, John 2, 19. So the Jews thinking that if you have other gods before the Lord, if you worship other gods, if you uh, bow down to idols. If you lie, you deserve death. And here's a man saying, destroy this temple. Blasphemous. Hello? Yes. And then, I will raise it again in three days. With what? With what? Do you have tools? Bob the builder? Do you have anything to do? Crane? Anything? Nothing. I will build it again. So this is pure lie. Pure blasphemy. Pure lie. And he deserved to die. You understand. This is why the, the Jewish leaders and priests all together conspired to uh, pass him over to death as a result. However, what Yeshua was referring to was a temple of his body. He was saying that I'm going to be put to death, but I will resurrect to life and reveal to you that it will be not in the name Jehovah anymore to the people of Israel. The words that I will speak are, will not be through angels or Moses even, but as the son of God, I will speak to you in the name of the father God, Yeshua, and this word, will be the word of truth that never changes. Hallelujah. So let's go to Hebrews 1, 1 to 2. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the universe. So here... In the past, you now it's making sense, right? What I've said, it's summarizing. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets, through the law, and through the prophets, which are the summary of the Old Testament. What's the summary of the Old Testament? Two things, the law and, wow, these guys are learning for free without taking logos. Hello. What's the Old Testament again? The law and the prophets. Keep that in your head, all right, because we're going to come back to that. The law and the prophets. They are all 
God spoke through, to the people through them, which is the angels through the law, right, and the prophets, the men who spoke the word of God. But now the time has come where God would speak to not just a small group of people, the children of Abraham, the people of Israel, but the souls of all men, whoever you are, whoever believes, can now hear the truth through the word of the Son. Who is the Son? We go to John 1, 1. Yes. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So the Word was with God in the beginning, and He was God. And then, verse 14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and Truth. Let's continue reading. John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who was at the father's side has made him known. Hallelujah. So here's the one who came from the father's side father's bosom who was with the father in the beginning and comes out of him in the flesh as man and he is the incarnate word he is the incarnate truth because it was full of grace and truth full of truth he only knows truth there is no false no lie in his lips only the truth the law of truth then the true instruction was found in his lips he can only speak the truth because he comes from the true father hallelujah do you understand? The word who was with God is the word who was with the true father. Are you with me so far? Yes, because God is the God of truth, right? The true God. The word was with God in the beginning. That's before the universe, before anything was made. Before anything, God decided to reveal himself. And that part of God that would be revealed to men is called the word. But that word is full of grace and truth. It is the truth. Because it was with the true God. True father. So. He is saying that. You will know that I am the truth. That I speak the word of truth. Because after I die. I will resurrect to life. And through my resurrection. You will have the testimony. That I am the truth. That's why he said. I am the way. The truth. And the life. Hallelujah. His words are the truth. Again. Very simple logic pieces here, logical pieces. Yeshua is the truth, right? So he said in John 14, 6, yes, I am the truth. So let's say to the Yeshua is the truth. You all have to remember this because we're going to check it in a second. Okay. And the word of Yeshua, he said in verse uh, John 14, 24, these words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. So Yeshua is saying the words that he spoke while he was on earth. For those three years, short three years of his public life, his ministry years, he spoke words. And the words are written in the Bible, right? So these are the words that do not belong to him, but he heard these words from the Father. When did he hear them from the Father? He didn't have a, like a little, uh, what do you call it, ear, ear plug thing in saying like, hey, next scene, scene three, if you're supposed to say, what, what? Okay. <laughs> you go, what? That's not how it happened. When did the son hear the word from the Father? In the beginning, yes, because the Father's word is truth. The word of the Father is the truth, John 17, 17. I know your, your word is the truth. Right? If I sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. Here is the Son praying to the Father. Right? So Yeshua is the truth. Say it together again. Yeshua is the truth. The word of Yeshua is whose word? Whose word? The words of the Father. And the words of the Father are truth. Therefore... The words of Yeshua are the words of truth. Quickly review with your neighbor what I just said. I'll give you one minute. We start with Yeshua is the? Don't smile. Don't smile. Move your lips. Yeah. Why are you turning red, Christian? Yeah. So the words of Yeshua, Josue, you don't have neighbor there. What's going on? Find your neighbor. Yeah. Strategically, you sat without a neighbor today, huh? I'll find your neighbor later. Okay. 
So the words of Yeshua are the truth. Amen. That's why on the mountain where um, it's referred to as Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, where he goes up with Peter and John, and they see Yeshua transfiguring, like he looks radiant. Uh-huh, radiant. And radiant, who shows up? The radiant face? Moses. And someone else shows up? Elijah. So three of them are talking. And to the Jews, right, the disciples, Peter and John, they remember Moses, radiant face, because he spoke the word of the Lord that he received, the law, the law. And Elijah, who was he? Prophet. What did I say? The Old Testament is the law and the prophet. Oh, I get so excited. I get so excited. Yes, I don't know about you, but you're all looking like, what is the big deal? That's why I have to see you on Saturday. Yes? Yes. So they were so excited, they want to build shelters. And they're like, let's commemorate this moment. Our Lord, Yeshua, is not nobody. He's one of them. Yay. So let's build a shelter for each one of them. And then there is a voice from heaven saying, while they, he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from cloud said, this is my son. Not Moses, not Elijah, but Yeshua. In whom I am pleased, very well pleased. Listen to him. What to him? Listen to who? Because his words are? The voice didn't say, listen to Moses and Elijah and my son. Only Yeshua. Listen to him. The voice from the father's voice from heaven said, listen to Yeshua. And when they were trembling and because they, they heard the voice and the loud thundering of the voice, they, when they lift up their heads, all they saw was Yeshua. Get up, guys. Let's go. <gasps> Did we just see? Because the law and the prophets are until, until the coming of the truth that is declared, spoken, and revealed through the Son of God, Yeshua. Hallelujah. The Bible is so perfect this way. That's why he said, truly, truly, I say to you. Because you guys have been all exposed to lies and lies and lies. Even if you were taught by your parents who are loving and try to teach you the right way of living and doing and things, they are also in lies. You went to school and you even prayed in the synagogues or whatever you did. All these are lies because no one knows the truth from lies. All, everyone has been born in lies. Let's go to John 8, 43 to 47. That entire chapter 8 is really speaking about the truth of Yeshua. John 8, 43 to 47. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Who is that? The one who murdered from the beginning, the one who's been lying all along. That is the devil. Remember, the devil who deceived uh, Adam through Eve also led their son, Cain, to kill his brother, Abel. So here's Yeshua talking about the devil. You belong to the devil. You are devil's children. And you can imagine the Jews who took pride and said, we are children of Abraham. That conversation comes up a little bit later in the chapter, but continue reading 45. Yet because I tell, you, tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. You belong to the devil. Because you are born dead in sin. All you've heard was lie. And you cannot tell the difference. So when Jesus said, I am, the, I am the son, I have been sent by the Father in heaven, they did not believe him. And he had said in John 10, 25, um, I did tell you, but you do not believe the works I do in my Father's name. Testify about it, meaning the signs they perform, uh, uh, opening the eyes of blinds and, and cleansing um, the lepers, people, and raising the dead even. They saw all of that, multiplying the fish and bread, and they're eating it, but they still didn't believe him. He said, I perform all these signs for you to know that I am speaking the truth. That I speak the words of the one who sent me. That's the father in heaven. And John 5, 46, 47 says, if you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? You don't understand what he wrote. The law, the Old Testament is all about me. If you knew what the Old Testament was about, the law and the prophets, you would believe me. But they didn't. And that's why they made sure that he was arrested and put to death. 
But when he died on the cross, what did he say? He said, it is finished. Like, he's dying like a criminal, naked, bleeding out. Horrible, horrible, brutal death. And what does he have to say about himself that he declares it is finished? Because that was when he was doing according to the command of the Father. John 10, 18 says, he was given the command to lay down his life. He obeyed the word. He submitted to the Father's word. Trusting the Father's word is true. Meaning that when he lays on his life, he will take it up again. The authority to lay down his life will allow him to use the authority to take it up again. He will lay down his life so that he'll be raised back to life. Now, why do you have to lay down his life? If you go back in Genesis 3, we're talking about Adam, our ancestor. God said to him, if you eat of, the, uh, eat of, eat of that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. True or false? Did Adam die after he took the fruit? Well, before he took taking the fruit, he, before the taking of the fruit, the serpent said, you will not surely die. True or false? <laughs> true or false? I, personally, I hate those questions. True, false, true, false. Those tests like, oh, TF, TF, TF. I used to hate those things. Yeah. So, but this time you have to know clearly what God said is always true. He never surpasses the truth. Right? So what he says is true. You will surely die. Certainly he sinned, Adam sinned, and death enters spirit. But death is waiting. The place of death. So when Yeshua came, he came as the last Adam. First Corinthians 15, 45. We talked about that last week. All men are first Adam. All died in sin. Now headed to the place of death, the fire of hell. But here is Yeshua coming, the incarnate word as a last Adam, the function, with the function to die. He will lay down his life and die to fulfill the word, you will surely die. Even though it's not his own sin, he, brought the, God, he took the sin of the world unto his body so that spirit body of his would die. And when he died, it was the moment that condemned the liar. Hallelujah. Do you understand? Where do we learn this? logos yes the will of god the will of god yes the devil had said you will not surely die and lie to adam and because of that all men have been under his lie all their lives and not knowing the truth and that's what happened to the jews even though yeshua the truth himself came they were in darkness in deafness deafness deafened by sin they could not tell the truth from lies. And they could not recognize Yeshua to be the truth, speaking the truth. But here's the moment he's fulfilling that word and that laying down his life willingly. He proved that God the Father is the only truth. He only speaks the truth. He never surpasses the truth. Hallelujah. And by dying in Romans 8, 3 to 4. But what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. The righteous requirement of the law. What does the law require of the sinner? Death. The law defines sin. And the law, according to the law of Moses, the law of the Old Testament, the law of God, the entire world is condemned as sinners. And sinners are condemned to death. So all men had to go and pay the wage of their sin, the penalty of their sin, which is death. All were sentenced to death. Again, not physical, spiritual, in the fire of hell. That became the destiny for all mankind. But by sending his son, God brought the son under the law, the time of the law, where the law is still reigning, the law of Moses. He took on the sin of the world unto his body. In, and coming in the likeness of sinful flesh, he took the sin of the world unto his body and paid the penalty of sin, the price of sin. And therefore he fulfilled, satisfied the law that demanded death from the sinner. So it has been paid for on, once for all. Hallelujah. For God never surpasses the truth, never surpasses the law. He even sent his son to die to fulfill the law. Do you understand that? And by that, we have been set free 
from the penalty, from the price of sin. Hallelujah! By shedding his precious blood, he gave birth to us, the souls. The precious blood, John uh, James 1.18 describes as the word of the truth. What is it called? The word of the truth. Because his flesh is the word of the truth. His blood is the word of the truth. When he shed his precious blood, he shed the word of truth to give birth to the souls of men. So whoever receives, John 1.12, whoever believes in his name can receive the right to become the children of God. Say amen if you have received and have become a child of God. Amen. He died, total death. But in three days, just as he said he would, he was raised back to life. Yeshua resurrected. Do you believe that? When he resurrected, his risen body, the spirit body, the spiritual body that's resurrected to life, testifies. That he alone is the truth. He alone is the true God. That his word is truth. Hallelujah. That resurrection of his body. Put into motion a new law. New truth. New truth is in town now. That is that anyone who believes him and his word. Can also. Can also. Be risen to life like him and enter eternal life. Hallelujah. First John 5 20 says, we know also that the son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life to testify this, reveal this. He sent the Holy Spirit from heaven, from the throne where he was lifted up to after resurrection. He sat down on the throne and it's from there. The Holy Spirit comes in his name, Yeshua, as the spirit of truth. When the spirit of truth, Yeshua promised in John 14, 26, when the advocate, the counsel of the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my my name will teach when he comes he will teach you all things and remind you of everything i have said to you when the holy spirit comes say amen if you receive the holy spirit who does the holy spirit come to he comes to those who have been born again as children not automatically you have to ask for him because he's a gift and the gift is given to those who long humbly desperately ask for the gift of the holy spirit they receive so if you have, you have been born again in that precious blood, the word of truth, then you can receive the Holy Spirit. Certainly we experience speaking in tongues. We experience all these things. But the Holy Spirit comes to do this, thing, this, this work, this mission, this task. That is to remind us of the word of Yeshua. To let us that his words alone are the words of truth. That means everything else is? Huh? Everything else is what? Everything else is? Lie. Everything else is lie because everything else changes. Do you understand? Everything changes in this world. Everything. There's no truth to be found at all in this world. No matter how intelligent, how smart, or how quote unquote pure, or how virtuous they might be. Even a pure baby or a pure man who's never seen anyone living in the woods and living a very, very separate sang uh, life of sanctity or uh, the purity. It doesn't matter. There's no one. No, nothing that is true in this world. The only truth has been revealed now through his resurrection. And that is Yeshua. And the Holy Spirit came in John 16, 13. So when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. Just as the son spoke the word of the father. The Holy Spirit came to speak the word of the father, which is the word of the son, Yeshua. So all three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, speak the truth. Hallelujah. So the Christian is someone who knows this truth. Let's go, to, uh, go back to John 8. And now we're going to read 31 to 32. To the Jews who have believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Free. Let's say, let's read again what Jesus said. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I know we read 832 all the time. But you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We understand. Who is the truth? Yeah. All I hear is, shh, shh, shh. who? Yes. Where's the confidence, folks? 
Yeshua, I am the truth and the life. Remember, he is the truth. Yeshua is the truth. Amen. So we know that knowing Yeshua, the truth, the truth will set you free. But if you kind of pull back and go back to the previous verse, is if you hold to my teaching, right? Hold to my teaching. What's the teaching about? Teaching of his word. If you hold to my word, that's what it means. If you know my word as the truth, if you believe my word as the truth, if you obey my word as the truth, you will know the truth. And the result is the truth will set you free. Hallelujah. So Romans 8, 1, 2 says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. You will know the truth. His word. Who he is. What he said. When you know, you'll be set free from the law of sin and, sin and death. The, sin and, the law of condemnation. The law that kills. You will be set free from because the truth sets you free. Truth gives life. Life will spring up as a result of knowing the truth. Hallelujah. There is freedom through the truth. See, people mistakenly understand this as, oh, free. No more law. No more law. Yeah, no more law. So in some churches, even mega churches, the pastor drinks. People drink. They party. They look just like the world. There's nothing different. And you know what they say? Because we've been set free. Don't be legalistic. COJ people, you're so legalistic. You hold over the law and you scared us. Do you know the same Bible? Do we read from the same? Do we know the same Lord? Same Yeshua. And do we know the same words of Yeshua as the words of truth? He is the one who commanded us. The word of the, word of the truth says you need to live, sanctify them by the truth. You need to live a life that washing away and washing, washing, continuous washing by the word of truth. We are to not live the same way as the world because set you to be set apart from the world. Those who are set free are no longer doing the same sinful things. So in John 8, in verse 1, the Pharisees catch a woman, a sinful woman in the act of sin, right? She's committed adultery. Most likely she's a prostitute in town. And they catch her. Instead of stoning her to death, which they had the right to, according to the law, two or three witnesses, according to the law, if you find someone to be committing sin, you must, you must also put that person to death. That's part of the law. So they could have done it, but they said, hold on, let's not do that. Let's bring her to Yeshua, who calls himself the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and see what he says. I mean, maybe we can bring charges against him. So they drag her to, to Yeshua. And bring her, she's just barely dressed, her hair unkept, probably bloodied, being dragged on the streets and those stony and, and rocky uh, streets. And she's brought to and, and thrown at the feet of Jesus. And they say, Jesus, Moses says to stone her to death. She's been caught in the act of adultery. What do you say? I say that's dilemma. I said, I said that's dilemma. Not to Yeshua, but I say that's dilemma. Because if you say, let her go. I am compassionate and loving, forgive her. Then he's going against the law of Moses. Your law is truth, the Old Testament says. And then what does that make of the law of God, right? Because the law came from God. But if he says, stone her to death, that's right. Law of Moses, kill her. How can it be the Savior? Instead of saying anything, instead, uh, however, Yeshua bent down to the ground and he wrote something. It was a sandy rocky so he could actually take a stick and write something. Everyone, because by then it was usually people would gather around. You know, the town people would come out to watch the stoning or they would partake in the stoning. So there were a lot of people there, children, men, whatever. So they were all looking and seeing what he's writing. And the passage does not describe what he wrote. But at the end of writing, he said, if there is any one of you without sin, be the first to throw the stone. You be, you be the first to stone her. So put that and Matthew 5, uh, 6 on and where he describes about sin. Because this is adultery and lust. He probably said, if you looked at a woman with lustful and had a lustful thought, then you have already committed adultery. If you said to your brother and said, you stupid, you've already killed them. You coveted someone else's things and you've already stolen. So what he probably wrote is about the sin of the heart. Because what we see is the people reacting. Their response to reading what he wrote is that they, one by one, dropped their stones and left. And he turned to the woman and said, woman, where are they? 
those who brought you, those who condemn you. And she's trembling, and she realized she's not dead. And she looks around, they're gone, they're gone. And she realized she's alive. And Jesus said, I don't condemn you either. So now go. Now, it doesn't say go and have a good life. Go and continue as you were. Jesus didn't say that. What did he say? Go and sin no more. Leave your life of sin. So what brought her to the feet of Jesus was the law of Moses. The law of sin and death. The law of condemnation. Who is Yeshua? He is the truth. And the truth setting her free from the price of sin. Now if she has really been set free. She will now show that by living a life of no more sin. Do you understand that? Amen. So that is someone who knows the truth. That is the Christian, the believer who has tasted the freedom through the truth. The law of Moses is the law of kill, the law that kills. But the truth is the law that to give life for one to live so that if you know, when you know the law of Moses, you may fall into despair. But when you know the truth, you have freedom. Hallelujah. So we understand that believers were those who joined, united with him in his arms. In, in his arms. We sang the song, hold me, hold me now in your arms. Right, in your arms. Believers are those who died in the arms of Yeshua. When he died on the cross, he died with the sin of the world. He died with me, the old self the sinner so I died with him in his arms and that when he was raised back to life now I can also rise with him through that resurrection to life to enter eternal life hallelujah that's what baptism does baptism is that bodily confession that we are uniting with him in his death that is what happened 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross and because he did so because I died with him. Sinners died with him. The law has nothing to condemn. Hallelujah. Do you understand? Because the law has now been satisfied. That said death to sinners. And sinners died. All men died with Christ when he died. Therefore, the true believer knowing this freedom. Now in freedom does everything according to the truth. James 1.22 says, do not merely listen to the word. So, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at the face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So when you're hearing the word of God from here, from the pulpit on the Lord's day, you don't walk away and flush it down the toilet and live as you were Monday through Saturday and then come back again on Sunday. That's like looking in the mirror and then walking away and forgetting what you look like. You all know what you look like. So many selfies. You all know what you look like. Siri knows what you look like. So you all know what you look like, meaning the word, word reflects, gives us the reflection that we are sinners we still need a lot of growing up to do, a lot of change to go through, a lot of changes. So I need to do according to the word. And I do it not by force, but in freedom. I choose to do it. I use my free will to obey. Hallelujah. Starting with baptism. Baptism is important because he commanded it in his name, in my name. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, the name Yeshua, which means the honor of God is involved in it. And therefore, we go in the water, be immersed in his name to glorify him, obey his command. He also said in Mark 16, 17, 18, in my name, drive out demons. Unclean spirits will bring curse on your body. And lay your hands on the sick and there will be healing. Even if there will be other ways of seeking healing, you can go through medical and conventional treatments. But he said, drive out demons in my name and lay your hand on the sick and there will be healing. So there's no doubt about it. It's clear who did it. And it's the power of the name Yeshua that did it. Hallelujah. Even though it may look fanatical, it may look crazy. We do it because it's doing it according to the truth. And we are by the Holy Spirit able to discern the word of truth from false teaching. Even if coming to the COJ week after week, it's like, Adam, 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 destroy, destroy, just finish, 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 do this, obey, obey, obey. It is. It is. It's like, oh, God, that again. 
Yes, it is. What do you expect? As Pastor Kang said, I'm preaching from one same book. I mean, you should consider yourself lucky that you hear a little bit different thing every week. <laughs> right? I mean, if you were like teaching from, I don't know, Book of Hamlet or I, something, you know, some novel, how creative can you get with one book? A year of 35 years, 52 weeks, a, a year. Oh, my Lord. Hallelujah. That I hear a little bit different thing every week about the same God, the same word. Hallelujah. Because it's in the church, the Holy Spirit speaks to the churches, in the churches, alone. Revelation 2 to 3. Let him who has ear to hear, hear what the Holy Spirit says to the churches. So, number one, the Holy Spirit speaks the word of truth to the churches, in the churches. And secondly, he speaks to those, only those, who have the ears to hear. Who are those who have the ears to hear? All of you have hearing, right? Right now, you're like, yeah, you get all excited. This is like towards the end. Someone said like, yeah, when pastor gets excited and she like, hides her, like raises her voice, it's the end. So you can go to the toilet after that. That's what someone said. <laughs> One day I'm going to be very quiet. It is finished. I'm going to try that. <laughs> so it's like, this is the part where like the train is running really loud. It's the climax of the movie, right? It's like the heightened, like that, the long chase, that intense chase right before the ending, right? Where the good guy captures the bad guy and then happy ending. It's that moment. So... You're hearing it, and then you're like, okay, she's getting louder, she's getting excited. But it doesn't mean that you're all receiving in your spirit. Some people, can, it can just remain in your, hitting the eardrums and the acoustic nerves, delivering the piece of information into your brain, and then that's it. Then we're in trouble. Once we go through the ears, it has to land in the spirit, the soul. So that the soul can live by it. Even if it hurts. Even if it's difficult. Even if it's too burdensome. If I resolve, I want to do it. And I say, amen. What do you say? Because amen means truly. Truly. True that. True that. That's what it means. Yes, I agree with you. That's it. So even if it's hard for me to do, I say amen. And I pray according to it. Then the spirit gives me strength. So I have peace. I have confidence. I have power. Hallelujah. So it's to be able to discern from truth, truth from empty words that are sweet to ear, sweet to the ear. So I choose to listen to the word that correct, rebuke, and encourage. Second Timothy 4, 1 to 4 says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Correct, rebuke, encourage. Yeah, listening to the word is not going to keep you easy. And a lot of people are like, I don't want to come to COJ anymore. It makes me uncomfortable. I feel so guilty. Because that's all you hear the word as. It's like, oh God, I, like, I'm checking my life with the word. Like I feel really bad. Okay, that's the, it, that's the beginning. And then you say, I'm sorry, Lord, help me. I need to be led. Teach me the truth. Guide me into all truth. I need to be led to the truth. I cannot keep on walking the wicked way, the false way. Psalm 1, 1 says, do not even walk in the council. Do not even listen. Do not even lend your ears to the lies of the wicked. Blessed is he who does not walk in the way of the wicked. So we do not walk in the way of the wicked. We need to walk in the way of the truth, even if it's hard. When the word comes as double-edged sword, Hebrews 4 says, double-edged sword, it pierces, it cuts, it's uncomfortable. If you stay that way, it will kill you. But when it's uncomfortable, you get on your knees and you say, you're sorry. Help me, therefore. I want to live by your word of truth. Hallelujah. And then he gives us peace. Amen? That's why we cry. And when we cry, it feels good. Because, like, I meant it. I meant it. I pour my heart out to seek his help. And then... He gave me confidence. He gave me peace. He gave me strength so I can walk out of here strong, confident that I could live the coming week according to his word. Hallelujah. Because for the time will come when people will not put up with the sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itchy, itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. In your hardship, do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. So time is coming when the world will become, churches will become more secular, more worldly. Because the pressure is on everyone else is doing it this way. Why can't we? Why can't we? But remember, the truth is never to be a compromise. Truth is not to be watered down. Truth is when something is identified as truth, everything else is untrue. And it could be the smallest part of the world. 
and it could be only one church in the world. But that truth is not to share, to be shared with untruth, with false. Just like there is no darkness and light. So the truth may demand isolation, loneliness, and it will demand hardship. It's the way of the cross. But this is the way to be. And when we come to the house of God, we need to yearn and long to hear the word of truth and love the word of truth. Amen. Say amen if you love the word of truth. Then when you hear it and you understand it, you must boast the truth. Boast the truth. Be proud of the truth as the apostle Paul was. Philippians 3, 7 to 9, he says, For whatever were gains to me, I now consider lost for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and on the basis of faith. Paul was someone who had a lot to boast of. His worldly knowledge. Number one, the knowledge of the law of God as a Pharisee, as a zealot, a zealous Jew. Perfect abider of the Jewish law. My goodness, who could? But he could. And he also was a scholarly man. He was articulate. He was able to engage with the Greeks and, and, and engage in their culture of debating and all that. But knowing Christ allowed him to let go of everything. And knowing him more and more realized, made him realize what kind of garbage all that is. How rubbish the worldly knowledge is. Because no one comes close to the truth. The fact that I have come this close to the truth. I will boast and boast, boast of the truth. Because the truth is the grace surpassing knowledge. Hallelujah. The grace surpassing knowledge of knowing God, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And therefore, knowing that truth, we resolve to never lie. Even though it may be impossible task to spend a day not lying. I don't mean like you're a professional liar. Maybe you are. You know who professional liars are? Politicians. Yes. I'm not saying that. That's the definition of like, uh, I think, I forget, a linguist or somebody. Definition of politicians are that they are professional liars. They have to. Whether you like them or it doesn't matter. They make all those promises. Right? Do they all keep them? They can't. They can't. So that makes them, by definition, Liars, professional liars. So maybe you're going like, I'm not a pastor. Okay, maybe you're not a professional liar. And hopefully you don't do this for a living either. Yes? Yeah, because a man of truth does not lie. A man of truth is not engaged in activities that are false. So we don't cheat anyone. We don't swindle anyone. You can't go into schemes and scheming others. And I have to resolve to not sin. If I find myself to be any little lie, quote unquote lie, white lie, you have to immediately repent. So that God helps you to not lie again. Amen? And ultimately such a man becomes a pillar. A pillar of the church that is founded on the truth. As a tr pillar of truth. So in that day he be taken up. Taken up. Making up that pillar in the holy city. Pillar means you cannot do without. How many of you want to go to heaven? And be with Jesus forever. The truth. Who only speaks truth and knows no lie, never lies, never ever lies. I realized as I was preparing for this and I'm praying once again. And my confession this morning is that I have no truth in me at all. My heart knows no truth. My body knows no truth. Because my body's changing. I realize it's not just like old, old, old people. I'm getting old too. I realize I'm not the same. And looking at a picture from 10 years, 20 years ago, like, what happened? <laughs> the hair, what happened? Because this body knows no truth. Entropy, <laughs> you don't have to give me physics. I know that in my body. This body knows no truth. This heart knows no truth. These lips know no truth. The only truth I know is Yeshua and his word of truth. And I am so honored. I am so humble. And I'm so proud. Hallelujah. And therefore I love him. I love Yeshua because he is the truth. I want his truth to be revealed through my life. To shine the light of truth. Because more and more the world is becoming 
darker and darker under lies. And people are compromising the truth with lies even in so-called churches. Churches are under pressure to accept what the world is saying is it's true. Even if COJ remains the last church on earth, we shall never compromise the truth. We will shine the light of truth as the beacon. A city on a hill shining the light of truth until we see the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's pray. When the Lord said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What he's saying is experience the truth, possess the truth, then you will live. This truth will set you free from sin and death. This truth will set you free from curse of sin that is sickness in your body, poverty, any hardship and situation that comes as a result of sin. All that you can be set free from anxieties and worries. You can be if you know the truth. And ultimately, we are promised to be set free from these bodies of death by partaking in resurrection to life in that day. How amazing is that? That I can know the truth. Let's be humble and show our humility by raising our hands to heaven and say, I want to know you more. I want to know more of this truth and truly experience the freedom in this truth and do everything according to the truth. Speak the truth, live the truth, and until the Lord comes back, build up the church of truth. Yeshua!